John Kennedy, was one of the most incredible wordsmiths ever to hold office in the United States. He had a remarkable ability to speak with precision, to speak with power, and I've been, for the longest time, transfixed by his ability to rally the country and unite people around a common dream or a common aspiration. And there have been many such aspirations in his run as president. JFK, I think, was one of the few people, at least in the American politics arena, who realized that great writing and great speech making was a tool to speak to society's highest aspirations for peace, for exploration, and for prosperity. When I've taken the time to analyze his speeches, both in listening to them and also investigating the texts themselves, there is no small amount of balance and rhythm and masterful craftsmanship, masterful speechcraft that is used to create what has gone down in history as some of the most powerful words, expressions in, in the American saga. I wanted to take this, t this, this video to share with you a few resources that I've come across. One is a recording from JFK when he was 20 years old, and it's a, it's a profound testimony to the fact that great speakers are not born, they are made, because JFK was not a charismatic, confident, and calculated speaker in his days in Harvard. In fact, he got a C in his public speaking class. I'll leave the article down below, but I want to play the recording here in a moment. And I also want to review a article that was written by JFK's speechwriter. Of course, JFK had very little input in, not very little input, uh, the, the speeches that were written for JFK were just that, written for JFK by an entire team that had a very clear and often simple objective in the message that these speeches were attempting to communicate, and JFK was the lucky mouthpiece for a lot of these great ideas. JFK's speechwriter was a, an, uh, was a lawyer by the name of Ted Sorensen. I actually wrote or read some of his book. No, I haven't read, read, I keep wanting to say written. I haven't read the full thing yet. But Kennedy had worked with Ted for multiple years, and Kennedy often referred to Ted as his intellectual blood bank. Sorensen absorbed as much information that he could and was almost a second brain for Kennedy. Kennedy would share, and this, the, the collaboration would work such that Kennedy would share a basic idea speech to communicate, say uh, a sentimental impact or the, the emotion that he wanted the American people to absorb. And Ted would work with that framework and that scaffolding to create something that would capture the heart of a nation. So let me go ahead and play for you. And I'll listen to this as well. I, I listened to this once a few weeks ago, and I thought I wanted to share with anyone who's willing to listen. This recording from 20-year-old JFK, this is from a presentation he did in one of his Harvard classes on public speaking. It's just about a minute long. My name is John F. Kennedy. I'm going to speak this morning on a subject we've spoken of twice before, Hugo Black. I'd like to take it from the angle of what's going to happen to Mr. Black if anything can happen. We all know the circumstances surrounding Mr. Black's appointment to the Supreme Court. Whether Mr. Black's appointment to the court is a correct one is hard to say. It was evidently done in the heat of presidential anger at the uh, conservative element who did not back Mr. Roosevelt's court plan. Whether Mr. Roosevelt was right in not taking revenge. One observation that I have just really quickly is notice there's a very quick cadence to what he has to say. He's speaking very rapidly. Some of his sentences are character some of his sentences are characterized by what is often called word blur. Word blur is where you run the end, the last word of one sentence with the first word of the next. You don't allow yourself a pause. I do this all the time, and I'm not here critiquing him as if I've mastered this in my own speaking, but that is a stark contrast to the Kennedy who delivered such speeches as the peace speech or his speech at, was it Rice University in Texas, where his words were not necessarily profound, but it was the emphasis, the slow cadence and the pauses that he was able to employ in his speaking that made them all the more impactful. ...and he went forward as he thought 
But Mr. Black's stand has been one, has been one uh, in the last few months, last few weeks rather, that has is, that is, uh, been one of secrecy, something that a uh, Supreme Court judge should not be expected to do. When Mr. Black received uh, notice of his appointment to the Supreme Court, in a few days he went down and in secrecy took an oath of office. Then he went to Europe. Why should he have taken this oath this way? Well, there's very few reasons. Maybe he was just in a hurry to get to Europe. I'll end it there. But in those last few sentences, there were a series of ahs and ums. There was a hesitation. There was a lack of confidence and conviction in what he was saying. And I don't know who he was speaking to. Perhaps he had every reason in the world to be nervous about delivering this presentation. I don't know what grade was associated with this or even if it was graded. But there was a undercurrent to what he was saying that lacked passion, that lacked power. And even the way that he asked the question, I forget the question that he posed there, but it didn't sound like a question. It didn't sound like it was posed out of a genuine quest for information or it was characterized by any curiosity. That clip I wanted to share with you, and you can listen to the, the rest of it. There's probably 30 more seconds below this video. I also wanted to read, there's an article that was published by ThoughtCo that I came across about a week ago. A friend sent this to me. And I started reading some of this. I haven't read the full thing because I wanted my reaction to be live on video because this is gold. This is actually, a, I believe it's an excerpt from one of Ted Sorensen's books, Ted being the speechwriter for Kennedy. And this is Ted talking about the Kennedy style of speech writing. And I just read a few sentences of this and I realized that I was going to thoroughly enjoy this short paragraph. So let me go ahead and dive right into this. This is the Kennedy style of speech writing. And let me see from this article, it will be linked down below. I don't know what book this is from, but I'll go ahead and read this nonetheless. This is Ted speaking. The Kennedy style of speech writing, our style, I'm not reluctant to say for he, Kennedy, never pretended that he had time to prepare first drafts for all of his speeches. Our style evolved gradually over the years. We were not conscious of following the elaborate techniques later ascribed to these speeches by literary analysts. Neither of us had any special training in composition, linguistics, or semantics. That's fascinating. Our chief criterion was always audience comprehension and comfort, and this meant, one, short speeches, short clauses, and short words wherever possible, and two, a series of points or propositions numbered or in logical sequence wherever appropriate, and three, the construction of sentences, phrases, and paragraphs in such a manner as to simplify, clarify, and emphasize. The test of a text was not how it appeared to the eye, but how it sounded to the ear. I love that. That is so true. It's not how it, what did he say? The test of a text. I like the alliteration. It was never how it appeared to the eye, but how it sounded to the ear. I often do this when I'm writing. I will write something that I feel is precise and accurately conveys what I'm saying, but it doesn't sound good when I say it out loud. There is a melodic, almost harmonious quality to words, the sentences that we speak that can do a better job of conveying emotion than the precision or the arrangement, the composition of the individual words can themselves if they were simply being read. I think Sorensen really internalized that in the collaboration between him and Kennedy. Reading on, his best paragraphs when read aloud often had a cadence not unlike blank verse. Indeed, at times, key words would rhyme. He was fond of alliterative sentences, not solely for reasons of rhetoric, but to reinforce the audience recollection of his reasoning. <laughs> if you see that, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at reasons of rhetoric, but to reinforce the audience's recollection of his reasoning. It's funny how he uses alliteration in that demonstration of alliteration. Sentences began, however, incorrect. Some have, may have regarded it with and or but whenever that simplified and shortened the text. His frequent use of dashes was of doubtful grammatical standing, but it simplified the delivery and even the publication of a speech in a manner no comma, parentheses, or semicolon could match. Words were regarded as tools of precision to be chosen and applied with the craftsman's care to whatever the situation required. 
He liked to be exact, but if the situation required a certain vagueness, he would deliberately choose a word of varying interpretations rather than bury his imprecision in ponderous prose. For he liked verbosity and pomposity in his own remarks as much as he disliked them in others. He wanted both his message and his language to be plain and unpretentious, but never patronizing. He wanted his major policy statements to be positive, specific, and definite, avoiding the use of suggest, perhaps, and possible alternatives for consideration. It's interesting. The words suggest and perhaps are largely employed by articulate speakers, and they are considered words that are indicative of someone who's very articulate. Perhaps we should consider this. I might suggest that we pursue this course of action. It shows that you have considered other alternatives. You are weighing other options in your mind, or at least you have that awareness. But it sounds like in the context to Kennedy's writing, I think in reference to any major policy statements, he wanted to show that there was a very clear course of action that he was considering, that a decision has already been made, and that there is no uncertainty or there, is any, there isn't any chance for misinterpretation. I understand that. There's a, there's a balance here that's happening, which is interesting. They've chosen to omit words like suggest and perhaps. At the same time, his emphasis on a course of reason, rejecting the extremes of either side, helped produce the parallel construction and use of contrast with which he later became identified. He had weakness for one unnecessary phrase. The harsh facts of the matter are, I feel like I can hear Kennedy uh, saying that, but with few other exceptions, his sentences were lean and crisp. Ah, I like that description, lean and crisp words or sentences. He used little or no slang, dialect, legalistic terms, contradictions, cliches, elaborate metaphors, or innate figures of speech. He refused to be folksy or to include any phrase or image he considered corny, tasteless, or trite. He rarely used words he considered hackneyed, such as humble, dynamic, glorious. He used none of the customary filler words. Example, and I say to you that this is a legitimate question and here is my answer. End of parentheses. And he did not hesitate to depart from strict rules of English usage when he thought adherence to them would grate on the listener's ear. No speech was more than 20 to 30 minutes in duration. They were all too short and too crowded with facts to permit any excess of generalities and sentimentalities. His text wasted no words and his delivery wasted no time. That happens to be the end of the quote from Sorensen, but there is a little bit more to the article that you can read. I don't want to go on for too long, but I've been amazed at how clear, precise, Kennedy was in his phrasing. And I don't simply mean to relegate those characteristics to his prepared speeches where he was able to have input from other people and, and have a symphony of minds that were working together to produce an end result. I have also observed in his debates, especially his debate with, I believe it was, was it Nixon? I can't remember. There was a debate. You can watch one of his early debates, and I believe it was the first televised debate. And he was very calculated, intentional with what he said. He spoke with confidence, and I would say that his sentences largely adopted some of the attributes that would come become uh, that would be embodied in his his prepared speeches. As in, he spoke in short sentences. He did not use filler words. And he did have, I remember a few words that he kept circling back to, phrases like the American saga. He would talk a lot about prosperity, and there were other words that had surfaced frequently in his lexicon, especially when he was speaking spontaneously. He simply was an incredible statesman and a spokesperson, and I wanted to share my awe in his ability to speak very articulately with anyone willing to watch this video. Thanks for watching and let me know down below if there's any admirable qualities of Kennedy speaking or of any political holders of office that might be worth reviewing in the future.